All right, if you have your Bibles with you this morning, we ask that you turn to the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 3 is where we'll take our text this morning. Revelation chapter 3, and we're going to begin reading in verse 14. Revelation chapter 3 and verse 14, the Bible says, And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would that thou were cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm, and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Because thou sayest, I am rich, and increased with goods, and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched, and miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment, and that thou mayest be clothed, and that, thy shame, and that the shame of thy nakedness not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in unto him, and will sup with him, and he with me. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in, in my throne, even as I have also overcame and am set down with my Father in His throne. He that have an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Amen. I'll be preaching, the Lord being my helper this morning, on the thought, the need for fire. Dear Lord, we thank You, we praise You, and we give You great honor, Lord, for just sitting on Your throne this morning and doing everything after the counsel of Your own will. Lord God, we pray this morning for the people that are here. We know that no one is here by happenstance, Lord, but rather by divine appointment. And we pray this morning that you would deal with your people. Lord God, have mercy on sinners that meet with us, that you might save them today. They may, uh, that they may know you particularly in the forgiveness of sin. Honor your word and we be faithful to praise you for it. For it's in Christ's name we ask. Amen. Now, uh, as John, by the inspiration of God, is writing down what God's, what the Lord Jesus says to the churches, not all of them are that good. Uh, in fact, all of them, all the churches had rebuked except the church at Philadelphia. And, you know, what that says to me is all the Lord's churches have, have means for improvement, right. have places in which they could do better. You know, I've never imagined a church. I've never known a church. The Lord's blessed me to travel a lot. I've never, I've never preached in one church that could not improve. Uh, you know, a lot of people think just because you preach sovereign grace that everything is great. Well, you know what? I, I've been in a lot of cold, cold, cold sovereign grace churches that what they really needed was a touch from on high. And so that's not the remedy. And Laodicea had some very specific problems. And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness. Now, you know what a true friend is this morning? That someone that will tell you the truth no matter the circumstance. That's a true friend. Now, you may not like what you hear, and it may not be a palatable message. And I know many times as a preacher, my messages aren't necessarily woo-hoo messages. But I will tell you the truth. And the reason I'll tell you the truth is because you're my friends. Now, that's a faithful and true witness. You, you, you know, uh, uh, Jared was showing me something that was kind of funny uh, about Joel Olstein. Somebody printed it off the internet. And, you know, he's just a, a, he's a rebel. That's what he is. And uh, uh, he's not your friend. You know, uh, a lot of these TV evangelists, they're not your friends. They, they do not have your best interest in mind. You know what mostly they're interested in? Uh, they're interested in uh, this right here. That's right. That's what they're interested in is your money. And, and so then we as 
the Lord's people, we need to understand and know, even though this church letter to Laodicea was somewhat scathing, it came from a friend. It came from somebody that had their best interest at heart. And that's what you need today. Under the angel of the church of the Laodiceans, write these things, saith the faithful and true witness, the, be uh, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works. Now let me say you, tell you this at first. Uh, if a church don't have works, they're not a real church. You can say what you want to. Uh, they can have good sound preaching. They do a lot of things. But a church was created for three purposes. One of them was to spread the glorious gospel of Christ through all the world as we know it. That is a purpose. Go ye therefore and teach all nations. That is one of the purposes of the church. Amen. The other is to worship Him and glorify Him. And the third purpose is to disciple new believers. There's two reasons a Christian, a new Christian falls on their face. One of them is they don't have nothing to start with. That's one reason. And the other reason is they've never been discipled. No one's ever taught them anything. Those are two reasons they'll fall flat on their face. And, and so then we as the Lord's people, we, uh, we need to understand and know that we have something to do. We have work to do. It's not finished. If it was finished, we'd be home with the Lord. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would that thou were cold or hot. Now if they were cold or hot, and they were cold, God would have something He needed to do with them. Now, this is, this is the problem. A lot of people, you know, there's a lot of contention about what cold and hot is and what lukewarm the church at Laodicea, what their condition was. But I believe I know what it is. Now, some of you won't remember this, but we did, we did as a child, we didn't have indoor plumbing. And to take a bath, you had to heat water. And to wash dishes, you had to heat water. And, and, and what you did, you, you, you heated a big dishpan full of water and you mixed it with the cold water to get it down to the temperature you could use it. Because if you just heated it and, and poured it off in there, it was too hot to use. And if you just got it out of the creek and it was too cold, it wouldn't wash your dishes. And so you had to have a gentle blend there and you learned to kind of do it pretty good so you would have exactly what you needed. Now, the hot church, the hot member is this, is one willing to spread the gospel at all costs. That is a hot member. A hot member is an individual that will go with the Bible when the rest of the world is going against it. When the Bible says, come out from among them and be you separate, that you're willing to believe that to the point that it impacts your life. You know, just because you say you believe something, it don't mean a whole lot to me. When I see it in your life, then it'll mean something. So those are the hot members, the one that the Word of God actually impacts and makes a difference in their life. Now the cold member, and I do believe you can run from hot to cold, but there's two cold members. Number one, they're lost. You know, we need to be very, very careful when someone says they're saved and look for, look for fruits, meet for repentance. Amen. However, I don't find one scriptural example of waiting two years to allow someone to be admitted to the church. Do you? It seemed like it was a pretty much of a priority to Paul. He took the Philippian jailer out in the middle of the night and baptized him. That's right. So, I, I won't go that far, but I tell you what, we do need to be careful. Because what will end up happening, you'll have cold people that could be lost people, and dump them in with the hot, and what's going to happen? Right? So if you have as much cold as you do hot, you're going to end up lukewarm. Right? And, and so, uh, and then the other type of cold individual is this, that loves the Lord, truly been saved, working for Him, and then all the things that the world has to offer begins to pull them away, and before they know it, they're cold. Now, 
That is the condition of many, many churches today. It's a lukewarm individual. Now, what, what, what did the Lord God say even in the days before the church, in the days where His relationship was with the nation of Israel, even back then, remember we read this last week or Wednesday night one, I can't remember. In Ezra, you remember? And He says, you're a mixed multitude. You have inbreeding. You've got all kinds of individuals from idolaters. And when I say that, I don't mean race. Uh, I, personally, uh, I personally don't have an issue with that because I don't think the Bible teaches it. I think it can cause problems, but I don't, I don't think it's an issue. But what I do have a problem is, is our children marrying Arabs. I do have children, I do have a problem with our children uh, marrying into Muslim nations that ought not to be. Because then that is a mixed multitude. You have idolaters and Christians in the same home. And, and, and so we as the Lord's people, uh, in that day there was a mixed multitude. And if you remember last week in our sermon, Ezra had to deal with that. And today we have a lot of mixed multitude. People that are on fire and on the ballpoint and people really who could care less. Right? That was Laodicea's problem. They dumped the ice water in with the boiling water, and what they came out with was a lukewarm church. And that can happen overnight. It doesn't have to be a long, timely process. With the world that we live in today, it can happen in a matter of days even. And so we as the Lord's people, we need, um, we need to understand the condition of the church at Laodicea and how they got there. Now, I want you to see the next thing that he says, I'll spew you out of my mouth. Now, that doesn't, you know what? You know, the rejection of Christ is not limited to the lost. Did you know that? He rebuked Peter in his face, did he not? So, just because you're saved, don't mean you're on fire. You know what? The hardest thing to do sometimes is to say, you know what? I'm done. And I don't mean done with serving Christ, but you know what? If you don't have a church that's connected, leave. Right? If they just are not interested in serving God, the Bible's very simple. Come out from among them and be you separate. Leave. And at least you'll stay hot. <laughs> right? And, and so then we as the Lord's people, we need to understand and know that uh, it's a very serious thing to be spewed from the mouth of God because that means He's no longer fellowshipping with you. Now I know I'm not the only one here at times in my life that the Lord Jesus has stopped fellowshipping with me because listen, He's not going to put His approval on sin. He never has. He never will. And don't tell me how much sweet fellowship you have with Him when you allow the fifth filth of this world to come down the pike. Because you know what? I, I don't see it being true. He never has put His approval on sin. Right. You know what? It's against His very character. He, you know, he ain't going to violate His own character. And so then we as the Lord's people, we need to take note of the church that lay out of sin because it not only impacted the cold ones, it impacted the hot ones too. And He rejected them by spewing them out of His mouth. Now notice verse 17. And I sometimes have, I think, over the years probably mispreached this lack of my understanding, but as I was studying, I think I finally get 17 right. Because thou sayest, I am rich, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. Now I always thought that that was a wealthy church. I don't believe that anymore. They may have had plenty of money, I don't know. What I believe was, they thought the five points was all they needed. Man, I'm rich. I believe, <laughs> I believe in total depravity. I believe in unconditional election. I believe in a, a limited or a particular atonement. I, I believe in sovereign grace. Well, woohoo. I know a lot of people that believe that. Right? They thought they had it all. 
I was even church to it. They thought they had it all. Right? I'm rich. I'm on ball point. I believe in separation. Come out from among them and be separate. You know what? You can believe all those precious truths and be cold as branch water. Right? And so then we as the Lord's people, what we need to see is that what He was looking for went beyond the rich truths that this book holds. He wanted to see how are you doing spiritually. You know what? This morning, uh, we, we believe that we have the truth. Glory to God we do. But how are you spiritually? Just because you're in a sovereign grace church does not mean you're spiritually okay. Did you know that? I, I've, been, I've been in some pretty bad spiritual conditions. So, so far from the Lord, I was, I, I was probably less than the Lord. So we find then that our mixed multitude is people that are spiritually sound, serving the Lord, and, and go, away, go away past attending services. And then we had this other group that uh, were just cold. Uh, you know, uh, the Bible teaches us this, the Lord Jesus in His own ministry, a little leaven, leaven is the whole lump. And so a little cold water goes a long, long way, doesn't it? And so we need to be very cautious because, I, because thou sayest I'm rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. And knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable. You, you know the t only time you really can get the idea that you're miserable is when you're alone. Because then you can't fake it. God knows, does He not? And then, and, and, and then you'll know. Uh, wretched people, you know, it's hard to acknowledge that. Wretched is miserable. It is hard to say, you know what? I'm just miserable. I, I don't ever have any peace. That, that's a difficult thing to say, isn't it? And, and especially among the redeemed. Because, man, we're supposed to be walking on cloud nine all the time, right? But you know what? After uh, 35 years of being saved, I found this. And that's just not true. I've had some pretty miserable days in my life. I, I, I have had some difficult times. And listen, I'm not talking about illness. You know, illness is to be expected. This body is, this body is depraved. It's going to die one day. Did you know that? I'm talking about spiritual difficulties. Things that will bring you down in spiritual sense. And, and, and there's no sense, there's no need, there's no logic in lying about it. We, you know, that's why he, he Peter wrote, confess your faults one to another and pray ye one for another. You know what? I can't pray for you if I don't know what to pray for. Amen. There's a, you know, pair, we, we believe in particular redemption. What about particular praying? Right? How, how can I know if I, how can I help you if I don't know? True. And, and so then we as the, we as the Lord's people, we ought to have an interest in, in, in being in a situation that we can be honest with ourselves all the time. You're wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. Now, the other two I want to cover very briefly is being spiritually blind. Because there's a whole lot of that going on. And these, uh, I hope at least, I don't know, they arrived at church. I hope they were redeemed folks. Uh, but they were blind. Now, uh, I once was blind, but now I see. So can you go blind again? I think at some point, yes. And I'll tell you how it happens is exposing yourself to sin again and again and again and again. It will make you messed up. You know, uh, these are the first glasses I ever had uh, that turn black or get dark even when I'm driving. Because used to the ultraviolet light is deflected from, uh, I mean, it's deflected from your 
car so these don't ever do it they, these have a way around that and when i'm driving it, it get, they, they, they shade in if they need it and it helps me to see because when that bright sun comes at me i just can barely get enough to get up keep it on the road now after a while <laughs> You basically can't see. You know, have you ever seen the face of the sun so long you start seeing those, those dots? And uh, that's how it is sometimes. But when I get away from it, my vision clears up. And that's where we need to be. We need to get away from this world so that our spiritual vision comes back. Laodicea couldn't even see that they had spiritual problems. Hey, I'm good. We're, we're good to roll. Uh, the membership is up. People are attending. We are a good church. And the Lord says, you don't even know where you are. Uh, and then lastly, He says, you don't even know you're naked. <laughs> you know what? Uh, we ought to be the most godly dressed people there are. Naked, you know what? That's not a spiritual term. That's a physical term. And what I have found is your... Uh, your morality is inversely proportionate to the hemline. When the hemline goes up, the morality goes down, and vice versa. And that's for men too. We we have a hemline too, and it's right here. You you see what I'm saying? And and, and so they didn't even understand their condition and the reason why they were blinded. You know why you're not? You know uh, you're not horrified at things you used to see and you were. It's because we're blinded. What about sodomites? You see them hand holding in the mall now. Don't bother you like it used to, did it? And you know why? Because we're getting used to it. We're getting used to the dark. That's, that's what we need to understand. Laodicea's problem was a spiritual problem. I don't think, I don't think that they were necessarily a wealthy church. You know what? I've never seen one of the Lord's true churches that wealthy to start with, financially speaking. You see what I'm saying? I think Laodicea's uh, poorness came from their spiritual character. They were no longer rich in truth. They were no longer rich in service. And so we as the Lord's people, we need to be a church that's rich. Verse 18, we find the remedy. I counsel thee to buy of me Gold tried in the fire. Now, you know, the, the thing that we don't like at Sovereign Grace Baptist is this. I want you to buy it. <laughs> and I'm not talking about the tie box back there. Y'all don't get it. Y'all don't get it. Don't lose me on this. But see, real study is going to cost you something. Real, real prayer time is going to cost you something. You know what? Uh, you may have to get up early. You may be like me and have to work every day. And the only extra time I have is when I make it. And that means getting up early or staying up late. And I'm not good at staying up late, so I have to get up early. For some prayer time. For some private study. But it costs me something. You see what I'm saying? Uh, a service to the Lord Jesus that cost us nothing is not much of a service at all, is it? It's a give me. And we live in a nation of gimmies. We, we, we live in a in total generation that wants something for nothing. But here the Bible says, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire. Now, that doesn't sound too pleasant. That verse always makes me think of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego who were cast into the fire for their service unto God. But when they got there, they found the person of the Lord Jesus. You're talking about eternal Jesus, just like you taught on. You know what? He said, uh, the, the, that old heathen even looked in there and said, I see a fourth person like unto the Son of God. Uh -huh. Uh, that, that's remarkable, ain't it? But see, they would have never met Christ in that way if they hadn't gotten fire. Mm -hmm. And you won't either. You, you won't meet Christ in that capacity. You won't heal the layout of sin and problem until you, it costs you something in the service of the Lord. You know what? It may cost you friends. What I found when I was a younger man, when I really became eyeball to eyeball with the Bible and it was my desire to serve Him, 
Uh, out of about six or seven guys I ran with in high school, I had one friend left. Let them go. <laughs> right? Don't let the door hit you on the way out. Because you know what? They're not really friends anyway. About like a, about like a <laughs> absence cousin, wasn't it? You, you come this way. And, and so we as the Lord's people, we need to understand and know that we are to serve Him in this way. It, 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 to serve Him to it cost us something. I counsel thee to buy me of gold tried in fire that thou mayest be rich and white raiment. Now he wants us white. And that means not smudged up with the world, not smudged up with sin. He, he wants you to wear a garment, a whiteness, a, a, a presentation that's pleasing unto him. That thou mayest be clothed and the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. And anoint thine eyes with eye salve that thou mayest see. This is the best salve you will ever have. Good King James Bible. And you get into it and you read it and you rub it on here. And see what? This is the end result. You begin to see things like God sees them. That, that, that's the eye salve. You know what? Until I read it, I really didn't think man was fully wretched. But when I got in there and studied this book, you know what? The, there's not one good thing about man. No, not one. That's why we can't make a decision for Christ because there's nothing good about us to make it with. Right? That's I say. Because you know what? Everybody wants to see it in a different way. Well, she can't help it. She had a hard, a hard life coming up. Well, so what? I don't know anybody that grew up, grew up with June and Ward Cleaver. Do you? Get over it. Move on. We're still responsible, right? We're still responsible. Yeah. Anoint your eye with eyesight. You know what? This thing down here is never going to be fixed. Anoint your eyes with eyesight. I like President Trump. I voted for him. Don't mind saying that I did. But you know what? He's not the answer. He's not the answer. And you know what? Uh, if we want to call him the left wing, I call him the world, the enemy. You know what the enemy's going to do? They're going to win. <laughs> this belongs to them. Anoint your eye with eyesight. Wake up. Look around, see the condition that we're in. And, and so we find the problem with Laodicea that they all could be hot, they could all be to the boiling point if they would just look at the Word of God. Verse 19, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten, be zealous therefore, and repent. Have you ever been rebuked by the Word of God? Boy, I have. I'm glad I have because you know what? That means I'm His. If I read that book and it don't mean nothing to me, the best thing I understand is I'm still lost. Right? You know, they had a problem. If you be without chastisement, then are you bastards and not sons? You, you, know, you know what a bastard is? That's an Ill, illegitimate child. And it, one that does not do his inheritance. One that's not the real deal. And I'm afraid God see you had a bunch of them. You know, uh, you, you know what Armenian doctrine against you? It gets you a generation just like this. You can't decide for Christ. You don't have nothing good to decide with. And, and so we as the Lord's people, we need we need a desire within us that we would not be at the, and zealous. You know what? There was a time in my life when I saw people who were zealous for repentance. And by that, they would say, listen, y'all pray for me. I'm in a mess. I, I'm having some spiritual difficulty. And you know what? They weren't ashamed to ask for prayer. I remember growing up down here in Carlisle, it wasn't even a sound church. Most of the poor farmers. And you know what? With tears running down their face, just y'all pray for me. I'm cold. You know what? You don't see that anymore. And you know what? <laughs> Pride. 
He, you know, you know why? You know what the good thing about them being poor farmers? They had no pride. Didn't they be proud, proud of? The man we do today, don't we? Or we think we do. Yeah. And, and, and so then we as the Lord's people, we need to understand and know what our, our, our base need is this kind of confessing relationship with God. Verse 20, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear me, hear my voice, and open the door, I will come in and will sup with him and he with me. <laughs> now this is the twist on this. Whom is he talking to? Anytime you find in the Bible something that you're not sure about, who's saying it and whom is he saying it to? Listen, he's not saying it to the lost, right? Who did it all start out with? The church of Laodicea, right? So number one, they got in a situation that God, but Jesus wasn't even welcomed in their home anymore. And he's saying, listen, uh, you're not opening that door for salvation. If you if you notice, there's nothing in that verse whatever about salvation, but what it is about is fellowship. Y'all want to go see Donna uh, after church today? I made the beds. Got them all straightened up. Y'all welcome to come. See, I made some preparations. Sarah cleaned the house yesterday. So we're ready. See, the problem is, you know why a lot of people don't ever meet with God? They made no preparations. None whatever. And, and, and so, we as Lord's people, we need to understand and know that huh, these individuals needed to meet with Christ even though that they were saved. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne. Now, last thing, and I'm going to go to one more place and we're going to be done. Not a very... <laughs> Not a very popular preaching. Him that You know what? People that fall flat on their face and stay that to stay in that position till they die, I have no confidence whatsoever in their, in their redemption. I'll go to their funeral and cry more from the per, than the person that, that died serving him. Because it says, Him that overcometh. Him that's victorious. Him that dies in the faith. That individual I will grant to set me. And the only other thing is him that doesn't. <laughs> Don't get to. Right? Uh, you have to assume that both are true. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so then we as the Lord's people, what we ought to do, our desire ought to be instead of dying in a cold state, that we would die on fire for, for Christ and die in a victorious situation. That is what our desire ought to be. You don't find that much today. Now, I want you to go with me to Acts 19, and I'm going to point out some things about an individual that was a fake. Acts 19, in verse 11. Acts 19, in verse 11. And God wrought spiritual miracles by the hands of Paul. Now, uh, I love the book of Acts. <laughs> For a long time, I almost avoided it because of some of the things that happened in there. But you know what? We need to embrace that book. Now, the reason that we get weary of it as bad is because it shows how powerful our Jesus, how powerful the Holy Ghost is. And so, well, that, that happened in the apostolic day. Right? Kind of walk around it if you can. The only thing I, I can find is this. We can ask demons to be removed and they can demand that they be removed. That's really, that's really the only thing I see different, right? And, 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 and so we find here that these special miracles, uh, and, and we'll get into them in a minute, was uh, with some divine healing that Paul was able to do. And... Uh, you know what? Uh, I still believe in divine healing. I think we have to go by the throne and ask for it. But he's certainly able to do that. Verse 12 this is a description of, uh, of those special miracles. So that from his body, so that from his body were brought into the sick handkerchiefs or aprons 
and the diseases parted from them, and the evil spirits went out of them. Now, uh, I remember, I'm, I'm old enough to remember when all, all preachers kept a napkin right up here. I remember that. And they spit so much they wiped their mouth. But that, that's really what it was for. And then they throw it in the pulpit and they go back and get it. Well, what it was, Peter had the, these cloths. And I don't know if he used them during preaching or if he just touched them or what. The Bible doesn't say. But he would hand them over and they'd take it to people like Joey or people that were sick. And they'd be healed immediately. And, you know, that, that's an unusual gift. I, I've seen people try to repeat that. <laughs> that was Paul's. It belonged to him. And, 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 and so we find then, as, as the Lord's people, that um, he had a, a very interesting divine gift with the, these, these cloths. Verse 13. Then certain of the vagabond Jews exorcist. Now, I want to say a couple of things about this. Uh, the, number one, it didn't say that they were believers. It said they were still Jews and they were vagabond Jews. A vagabond is somebody always looking for money. That's what a vagabond is. They travel from town to town and if they can get your money, they're going to get it. Right? And these individuals wanted some of what Paul had. Now, I also want to point out in the Scripture, Paul wasn't receiving money for this. But they wanted some. You know what? If I, if you call me and say, Brother Larry, would you come and pray for me? And I said, yeah. Uh, and I charged you $20 when I got there. You can throw it to the side right there. Because you know what? I'll come and pray with you just because. Because I'm interested in your spiritual health. And, and, and so we see that these vagabond Jews... Uh, being the, the nature they were, they saw a racket or a means to make money. And, and so they went with it. Then certain of the vagabond Jews, exorcists, took upon them to call over them which had evil spirits the name of the Lord Jesus, saying, We adjure thee by Jesus whom Paul preacheth. Now I will say this, apparently they had some success before in exorcisms because they decided to switch their focus to Jesus. Listen, just as real as demonic presence and demonic possessions, we talked about that last week, they lead people too. I don't think we can demand it, but I think we can pray for it. Now the problem with Baptists today is we don't even recognize it when it's there. Right? Uh, demonic possession today is just as real, if not more, because they waxed worse than it was in the days of the Bible. And, and, and what we need to do is pray and seek God's face that He might relieve some of these demon-possessed folks from what's, what, what they have. So they throw out the name of the Lord Jesus. And there were seven sons of one Sceva, a Jew and chief of the priest, which did so, <laughs> and the evil and the evil spirit answered and said, "Jesus, I know, and Paul, I know, but who are ye?" Now, can you imagine putting on this big show and saying, "I adjure thee by the name of Jesus, come out!" And this wafty demonic voice said, "Who are ye?" Man, that would that would get your attention quick. Yeah. See, this is the thing. That little Jew didn't really believe that there was a spirit world. You know what? As much as we believe the name of Christ, we need to understand and know that third of the fallen angels is just as real. You know, the Bible says they were cast to the earth, right? So they're still here with us. You, know, you, you remember when Jesus uh, uh, cast out those people of the maniac of Gadara? And... It was at least 2,000 because it got in them cows and, I mean, excuse me, those pigs and they killed themselves. See, that influence is still around. And, and don't you ever forget that. If you don't get nothing else out of this message, you remember that. And, and so this very powerful demon says, I know Paul and I know Jesus, but who are you? He was a fake. He needed fire that he didn't have. And the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them and overcame them and prevailed against them so that they fled out of the house 
naked and wounded. Now, I want you to notice two things. Remember how many there is. Sceva had seven boys, and Sceva himself made eight. I want you to see that a demonically possessed man knocked them all for a loop. You know what? That ought to leave us shaking in our shoes this morning, knowing that a demon is so powerful that he can influence one individual, one regular man, to beat up eight. And you know what? That's still out there today. We, we need to understand, listen, nothing has changed. You know what? We've changed, but the spirit of dominion has not changed. It, it, it's still there. And it's still doing the very same thing. You want to know why somebody goes into a movie theater and, and wipes out about 18 or 25 people? Because they have a demon in them. Not popular preaching, is it? But this is the thing. It's true. It's true. And, and, and so we uh, don't need to be fakes. Sceva was a fake. He was a liar. He lied to himself and he lied to others. You know what? The worst lie you will ever tell is a spiritual lie. Two spiritual lies I know about. First, oh yeah, I'm saved. I said the sinner's prayer. One thing is, the Bible don't promote no sinner's prayer, right? This doesn't. That's one lie that'll mess you up. And the other lie, redeemed folks, oh, I'm fine, I'm fine. You know, I like truth, don't you? Now, uh, I used to, she, uh, I love her to death, still love her to death. She's my secretary for about seven, eight years, Rita. And, uh, Never ask Rita how she is unless you have a little time to spend. Because she's going to tell you. Uh, I mean, she's not a fine person. She will start how her ex-husband's treating her right on down the line into the present day. But you know what? At least she's honest. She doesn't say, I'm fine. You know what we, 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 we do to ourselves? We lie and we say we're fine. Mm -hmm. I'm fine. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When do we say I need some help? When do, when do we say I'm in bad shape spiritually? I, I need some help. I need you to pray for me. My money's fine, but you know what? They don't go very far. I need some help. I need, I, need, I, need, I need something spiritually. And, and I really believe today that was Laodicea's problem is they had a bunch of skeevas on the hand and it resulted in this. Now, I, will know, I just want to interject in 16, just like the church at Laodicea, we find that after the devil was done with this group, it left them naked. You, you know where sin will take you in, in, in both spiritually and literally, it'll leave you naked. You know why bikinis are such a popularity right now? It's because of sin. Of sin. Because sin leaves us naked, right? You know why uh, pornography is at an all-time high? You know, uh, <laughs> and I'm not talking about just my descendants. I'm talking about Filth on the internet. You, you know, you, you know why that's at an all high time, all time high, because of sin. Because of sin. And, and you know what? It leaves those folks, it leaves them naked, does it not? And the sad part, people that are supposed to be redeemed, is eating it just like a, just like a cow eats grain, right? That, 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 that's an indication of where we're at, is it not? We, we need some spiritual help. We need to be the repenters. We need to be the individuals that, that desire more than anything else to be on fire. We look, at, uh, look at the results. Verse 18. And many that believed came and confessed and shewed their deeds. And many of them also, which used curious arts, brought their books together and burned them before all men, 
and counted the price of them and found it to be 50,000 pieces of silver. You know what? Uh, this is what you need. You know, in this little room back here, we have all of Spurgeon's sermons. You know, they're fine ideas by man, but that's what you need. That's what you need. Uh, you know what the zodiac is? It's curious art. Leave it alone. You don't need to know your stupid horoscope. You know what? That's a man about like me writing something on a piece of paper. They don't know anything more about the future than I do. Right? But it is a curious art, isn't it? And you know, I love the Bible's wording there. It is curious, isn't it? It kind of pulls you in. You know, when I'm curious about something, what I do in the modern age, I try to find out what it is, right? Because I'm curious about it. We need to, we need not to be curious about things that don't belong to the Lord. You know who we need to be curious about is Jesus. You know who we need to be curious about is the Holy Ghost. We, we need to have an interest in them and not what this filthy, stinking world has to offer. Right. What about you this morning? Are you more a Philadelphian? Or are you more a left seed? Are you more hot? Are you more cold? Now, it all depends on the individual, and unfortunately, really, if you like me, it depends on the time. Now, I've been really excited about this meeting that's coming up. And I'm kind of getting hot about it. I'm kind of getting glad about it. But you know what? And I wake up in the morning, I'm going to be cold as, <laughs> as a blizzard's wind, right? So, which do you really want? 